Howdy folks, Jamboriki here. DreamWorks are no strangers to creating big franchises through sequels, and I'm going to be ranking every single one of them in this video. A couple things before we begin though. 1. It's been many years since my top 5 best and worst DreamWorks movies list, a video that's most likely very dated by now, so please don't expect my following rankings to match up exactly with that countdown. Opinions can change over time. 2. I will be counting prequels and spin-offs for my rankings. Before anyone gets upset at this decision, keep in mind that I base this choice on a fan poll, and the word sequel can be used as an umbrella term for various types of film follow-ups. With all that said, let the ranking start. Shrek the Third Shrek and Fiona have been running the kingdom while King Harold is bedridden, a job that Shrek really hates. Then, when Harold sadly passes away, Shrek and Fiona must take over the throne. Shrek is adamant to find a replacement though, so he heads to a high school to pick up Fiona's cousin Artie. Before he leaves though, Fiona announces that she's pregnant, which leaves Shrek feeling awkward. After Shrek collects Artie, Puss and Donkey end up putting the boy off from becoming a king, and he tries to steer the ship back. Shrek and Artie fight over the wheel, only for our heroes to end up shipwrecked on an island. Luckily, said island is the home of Artie's old teacher Merlin, who could help them return home. Meanwhile, back in Far Far Away, the vengeful Prince Charming has taken over the kingdom and plans to stage a show in which he kills Shrek. For the longest time, I felt like this movie didn't merit its bad reputation, and I was even prepared to make a video to defend it one day. After hearing out people's negative criticism though, I do now understand why it's considered to be a terrible film. It really is just the scraps of Shrek 2, from using the leftover villain of Prince Charming to recycling transformation antics again. Oh. How in the hands, Christian Anderson, am I supposed to parade around in these goofy boots? Hey, 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 be very careful with those. <laughs> I don't get the impression that this movie's premise came from a place of passion. Shrek the Third also greatly lacks the witty irreverence and clever dryness we've come to expect from a Shrek movie. That anti-Disney edge has been replaced by juvenile pandering. While the other Shrek films could appeal to the whole family, the sequel is geared way more towards just very young kids which will certainly alienate half the usual audience. There's a bigger emphasis on characters being loud, zany and gross out. Sure, the Shrek series has always had a cheeky side, but its flatulent jokes always lend to character development or world building. When the satirical comedy isn't being annoyingly obnoxious, it's just pointlessly mean-spirited instead, mainly in any scenes involving the petty and argumentative princesses. Had we just stayed put, like I suggested, we could be sipping tea out of little heart-shaped cups. Yeah, yeah, heart-shaped cups. And eating crumpets smothered with Loganberries. Yeah, oh, Loganberries. Shut up, Cindy. Yeah, shut up. It's the film's in-your-face overtness that prevents Shrek's fatherhood drama from coming off as earnest. His fears are either played for silly giggles or spelt out to the audience like we're dummies. We're heading back to Far Far Away one way or another, and you're gonna be a father. What? <clears throat> you just said father. You're. I said king, you're gonna be king! While I'm comfortable pointing out all of this film's problems, I can't say that I share everyone's same level of anger. I've seen so many people treat this film with disgust but I just don't feel that rage inside myself. Sure, this is mainly due to personal nostalgia, but I do actually see some potential for a better movie here. Nuggets of gold hiding in the soggy mud. In one very underrated campfire scene, we learn that Artie was abandoned by his dad, and we get this very genuine moment in which Shrek shares his own father issues, while also giving Arthur some profound advice on self-love. People used to think I was a monster, and for a long time, I believed them. But after a while, you learn to ignore the names that people call you, and you just trust who you are. I think it seems like this, as well as a couple of jokes, and the film's interesting theme of forcing legacy versus earning legacy. This was supposed to be my happily ever after! Well, I guess you need to keep looking. Because I'm not giving up my... They stop me from despising it as much as the rest of the animation community does. Look, I'll openly admit that it's very flawed and a huge step down from Shrek 2, but it just doesn't boil my blood enough to make me hate it. Madagascar, Escape to Africa. Continuing straight on from the first Madagascar, Alex and friends hop on a plane home to New York, but the plane falls apart and crashes somewhere in Africa, where Alex reunites with his parents, Marty meets his fellow zebras, Melman becomes a witch doctor, and Gloria falls for Motomoto the hippo. Unfortunately, Alex fails a Lion Kingdom trial, but his dad refuses to banish his own son and decides to retire as king, only for the evil Makonga to take over the throne and banish Alex. 
Meanwhile, Melman struggles to confess his feelings to Gloria, and Marty doesn't like how he doesn't stand out and he's ever heard. So I do have to praise this film for being a little less hyperactive and chatty compared to the first movie, but that's really the only improvement it makes. Overall, it's a very overplotted film. Plus, said plots have sitcom stakes and have to compete for attention. It's like watching a bunch of Madagascar TV show episodes stitched together. The only plot that has any kind of cinematic scale is Alex's. But that's just a diet version of The Lion King. I don't easily accuse movies of being rip-offs nowadays, because nothing is 100% original. But this really is just The Lion King without any of the epic drama or profound tragedy. A baddie lion takes over the throne he's always wanted, and forces the prince into the Outlands, but said villain does a terrible job leading the kingdom, and it's up to the shame prince to restore the balance. The only difference is that the original king lives, and has to learn to respect that he some wants to be a performer instead of an athlete. Which even by 2008 had become an overdone cliche father-son conflict in films. And we get the same old tired dialogue that we expect from this formula. You're a lion, I but I've never fought another lion in no, my life. No, I guess not. You dance. And other stuff. Oh, and it's kind of frustrating how Alex's dad knows full well how desperately Makonga wants the throne, but he never keeps an eye on Makonga and always falls for Makonga's nice guy act. The only aspects of the film that work for me are the adorably funny penguins and the bonkers old lady, both being their usual hilarious selves. What is all this rock and roll racket? Oh, oh. Is she dead? No. But they're always the best parts of any Madagascar title. Madagascar 2 felt like a chore for me to sit through. Sure, it has some pretty African backdrops to ooh and ah at, but that doesn't really save how mediocre it is. The Croods. A New Age. In this sequel, the Croods discover a paradise that happens to be owned by Guy's childhood family friends, Phil and Hope Betterman, who are noticeably more civilized and advanced than the Croods. While Grug resents the Bettermans and their fancy home, the rest of the family become enchanted by its many luxuries. The Bettermans themselves look down on the Croods and plan to scheme to hook up Guy with their daughter Dawn. I really did not enjoy this film. There's a hint of an attempt to explore how modern luxuries can make people disconnected and unambitious, as well as how a rapid growing civilization can ruin the ecological balance. But Croods 2 is way, way more interested in crazy loud shenanigans. You wanna play fetch, Douglas? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go get it! No! Oh! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! And so popular domestic squabbles. What's a man cave? It's a place I go to get away. Away from what? Away from you! Duh! What? We're all thinking it. How dare you? How dare you? How dare the both of you? It doesn't help that Grok is completely reset as a character, because he's gone straight back to being insecure about his manhood and helicopter parenting Eep all over again, as if he never learned to be a better and healthier family man at the end of the first film. You were trying to take my daughter away, promising my baby girl butterflies and babbling brooks. Ah, uh, ah! You see? I knew you were listening. Sure, the animation is very expressive, giving us some silly faces to giggle at, and characters' reactions to things can be funny, but most of the comedy recycles the same five or six jokes over and over again, this repetition leading to okay jokes becoming stale quickly. For the most part, nothing much even happens. We're either watching the Croods lounge around, or the Batman's acting cultish and snobby. That's really it. I never felt like I was having fun, and the comedy was not good enough to compensate for this boredom. It's not until the very finale when we finally get a bigger stake than a forced love triangle, when it's revealed that the Batman home is the only source of bananas for a bunch of punch monkeys, who need to feed their kaiju god to live in peace. This is when things get exciting at long last, as the female characters don badass cave punk outfits and save the day as a united sisterhood, while taking on a ginormously huge monster who could easily squash our heroes. I did also quite like the relationship between Eep and Dawn. I fully expected Dawn to be this bratty man-stealer, but she's a fun kid after a venture who develops an adorably girly friendship with Eep. This is amazing! What do we do? What do we say to each other? What's happening to our voices? Where are we going to die? <laughs> and is genuinely offended when she learns that her parents wanted to hook her up with Guy. Cruise 2 has its high points, but you have to sit through obnoxious bickering and mixed bag comedy to get to anything good. I have zero interest in ever watching it again. Boss Baby Family Business Tim is now a grown man, married to a wife called Carol, and raising his two daughters Tabitha and Tina, while Ted has become a successful CEO and has distanced himself from his brother. One night, 
Tina reveals that she can talk and that Tim and Ted have been assigned to a special mission. They need to transform back into kids again and have to go undercover at Tabitha's school for gifted children, run by the eccentric Dr. Irwin, who turns out to be an evil baby in disguise and has devious plans to use a phone app to brainwash adults. Unfortunately, the brothers struggle to get along and Tim wants to focus more on helping Tabitha's schoolwork. This movie certainly retains the same wacky sense of humour as its predecessor. Even after watching this film a second time, I still laugh consistently at a lot of jokes, no matter how dumb or silly the gags got. Oh, Timothy, it is you. Hey, what was that for? You cast me into eternal darkness and wreak havoc on my circadian rhythms. The actual storytelling, though, well, it's kind of all over the place. Things happen at random, and there's a wobbly, unfocused direction. Sure, the film is very much about two brothers learning to focus and build their teamwork, but Tim's constant distractions from the mission result in a messy pacing. The movie is also missing a lot of the brotherly heart that the first film had, because the comedy and drama is driven by Tim and Ted not getting along. I mainly remember the many, many scenes of infantile fighting, more than the one or two scenes where they make up. I'll succeed in the mission. You can take the pony out. The only thing you're ever going to succeed at is being alone. Fine. 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 I also dislike how uncanny valley our villain is. Yes, Erwin is supposed to be sinister, but he's creepy in an uncomfortable way, not in a fun, scary way. I still find Jeff Goldblum to be a terrible miscasting for Erwin's voice. He's really phoning it in, and his trademark mannerisms make Erwin's baby form even stranger. It's time for the candy volcano. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's good. Up to you! What are you doing? What are you doing? No, 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 no. No. Ah. It's a stretch to call it a good movie, but I can't say that I dislike watching it, because there's an entertaining madness to its unrestricted chaos and weird sense of humour. I'm also a sucker for cute daddy-daughter stories, and while I feel iffy about Tim pretending to be someone else to get close to his daughter, which is borderline spying... That's really dad? Yep. I said a lot of stuff to that kid. I do empathise with Tim's fear of his daughter growing up too fast. Don't you think I'm a little old for that now? Uh, okay. I think it's time we both grow up. Boss Baby Family Business lacks the earnestness of the first film, a movie I've actually warmed up to over time, but it's kind of a guilty pleasure to me. It makes me laugh lots, it hits my paternal feels, and its nonsensicalness stops it from being completely dull. Kung Fu Panda 3. After the evil Kai escapes the spirit world, he plans on stealing every martial arts master's chi by turning them into jade zombies. Meanwhile, Po finally meets his biological dad, Li Shen, and the two hit it off. Po and the Furious Five then learn that the only way to defeat Kai is through Qi magic, which only pandas know how to do. So Li Shen offers to teach Po the art of Qi magic, if he comes back to the panda village with him. Po agrees, and Mr. Ping sneaks into his son's backpack to tag along. Po and Li Shen bond over panda traditions and activities, but never learn any actual Qi. Then Li Shen confesses that every panda has forgotten Qi and that he tricked his son into coming home, because he didn't want to lose Poe again. When I first saw this movie in cinemas, I was awestruck by the whole thing, and I loved it. But I've started speculating that this was all just fan gushing, because a second watch has made me realise that this isn't actually a good movie. I don't like how some characters have completely rebooted their arcs. Kung Fu Panda 2 ended with Poe finally discovering himself, Plus, Mr. Ping learned to let Poe go on his own adventures without him, and came to accept that Poe sees him as a dad despite not being biologically related. Arcs wrapped up. In this sequel, though, Poe is facing an identity crisis all over again, as if DreamWorks didn't know what to do with him next, while Mr. Ping has become possessive of Poe and paranoid that Li Shen will replace him. What am I doing? Getting a backache. Did you have to step on every rock? No, I mean, why are you here? What was I supposed to do, huh? What if the pandas don't have food you like? You're never going to be able to save the world on an empty stomach. Speaking of Li Shen, he's the biggest reason why I've come to dislike this movie. He selfishly manipulated his son into coming to live with him, all while the valley has been left in danger without their dragon warrior, and a powerful villain rages the lands. The film acts like this was a whoopsie-daisy mistake on Li Shen's end, and the Poe should forgive him, with Mr. Ping saying this line, Sometimes we do the wrong things for the right reasons. I'm sorry, but good intentions don't trump putting China in danger and lying to your own son about their long-lost culture in a time of need. I also find it really, really hard to believe that every single panda has completely forgotten how to perform magic. That's quite a big stretch to expect from audiences, but I find it even harder to accept that they all conveniently master Chi under a minute once Poe needs their help. I totally get how the film wants to show how family love can make Poe stronger, but it just comes off as contrived and sappy. 
Surely the villain holds up, right? Well, Kai is very intimidating to look at thanks to his bulky ox design, and it is devious how he's collecting Jade Zombies of Masters to do his bidding. But beyond those novelties, there's not much else to him. The film gives him this whole origin tale about how he used to be friends with Uguay, but once they arrived at a panda village, Kai insisted that they should steal every panda's chi. Uguay protested against this atrocious idea, the two fell out, and Kai was sent to the spirit world. Kai frequently mentions Uguay, but the friendship was never really developed, so this supposed rivalry comes off flat. Very tacky. How dare you set foot on these grounds! Oh, and it's disappointing how our villain's backstory is a whiny, My friend wouldn't enslave a village with me! Wah, wah, wah! It doesn't help that the film makes him the butt of the joke a lot, which dampens his menace and threat as a villain. I'm going to take your chi, then the chi of every panda in the- uh, shit chat! In this shitty chitty chat chat in chat chat chat! In this- Chit chat! Are the fight scenes great? Oh sure, but that's to be expected from any Kung Fu Panda movie. It's the bare minimum. Do I like the film's message of be your best self? Totally, it's a nice sentiment. But I don't think that this particular film earns it. As sad as it is for me to admit, I now see Kung Fu Panda 3 as the downfall of a brilliant franchise. Spirit Untamed, loosely based on the TV show Riding Free, which was inspired by DreamWorks Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, Spirit Untamed is about Lucky Prescott, an energetic girl who loves wildlife. When she ends up ruining her granddad's political campaign party though, she's forced to go live with her estranged father Jim, who hasn't seen his daughter since his wife died in a horse riding accident. While Lucky stays in the countryside, she befriends Abigail and Prue. The girls help Lucky bond with the feisty stallion Spirit. But it takes a while for Spirit to trust Lucky. Then, when Lucky ends up riding Spirit to freedom, her dad is very upset at her and grounds her for what happened. We then learn that a bunch of crooked rustlers plan on selling off Spirit's own herd. So Lucky, Prue and Abigail go on an adventure to help Spirit rescue his family. First of all, I think this spin-off slash standalone sequel does a decent job capturing the spirit of, well, Spirit. This free and defiant stallion who cares about his herd and keeps up a barrier to humans, but can be a loving friend if a human treats him right. This really comes through in Spirit and Lucky's bond. I mean, a big chunk of the film is about Lucky learning to be patient with Spirit, which in turn teaches kids watching the film about respecting the boundaries and feelings of animals. <sighs> I also quite like the animation for all the horses in the film. None of these horses have speaking voices, or even inner monologues, so all their feelings, gestures and personalities have to shine through in the animation. It's also fantastic how all the girls' horses have their own personalities that happen to mirror their owners. Speaking of the girls, it's really great to see an animated movie that's been made directly for little girls who love horses, starring relatable kids their age. Lucky, Abigail and Prue have uniquely different personalities that can clash, but the friendship is very sincere. They're genuinely good pals with a healthy relationship founded on a mutual love for horses. Tomorrow, we face our destiny. But tonight, we feast! <laughs> oh, yes, I am starving. <laughs> now, Jim and Lucky don't get much screen time together, and when they do share a scene, it's either really awkward or full of arguing but it's Lucky's decision to run away that actually develops their relationship. Jim learns that bubble wrapping his daughter just pushes her away, and that he shouldn't underestimate what she can do, while Lucky comes to realise that she's been overestimating herself, and begins to kind of understand things from her dad's perspective. He really talks about me that much? Sometimes my dad pretends he has to go to the bathroom just to get your dad to stop talking about you. I think the only aspect of the film that I dislike has to be the villains. They are cliché poachers that you see in every single Wildlife Kids movie, and there's nothing particularly threatening about them. Heck, the menace is being toned down dramatically to give the girls a fighting chance, which makes for a very anticlimactic and underwhelming final showdown. Put her out there! Yes, sir! Oh, oh no, you don't! Oh, no, you don't! My six-year-old brother moves faster than you! Look, I know that this film has a pretty negative reputation in the DreamWorks fan community, but I personally think that folks are a bit too mean to it. Sure, it's nothing remarkable, but I do think it does a good job telling an okay story that appeals to little girls who love horses. Trolls World Tour In this troll sequel, Poppy is now the leader of the Pop Trolls, but she's doing a poor job of listening to her people. We also learn that the world of the trolls is much bigger than we thought, and there's a land for each genre of music. Meanwhile, 
Barb, the ruler of the rock trolls, hopes to steal the music strings of every genre, so that she can turn them all into rock strings and transform every troll into a rock zombie. I will say that this film is better than the first trolls, but only because it seems to be trying a little harder this time. It still has remnants of things I disliked about the original film, like forced karaoke songs that rarely added to the story, comedy that thinks that loud noises are funny, and garish colours that are an eyesore to look at. However, the film is surprisingly socially conscious for something so corporate. While Poppy's stubborn ignorance towards accepting negative feelings can be irritating, Oh, they must not know that music's supposed to make you happy. <gasps> it does lend to a good message about listening to others, and not cherry-picking what you want to hear. You only hear what you want to hear and it puts us all in danger. How are you supposed to save the world if you can't even keep us safe? A very valuable lesson to kids, especially if they're in charge of a group during playtime or school. Plus, when we meet the funk trolls, the movie is willing to open a whole can of worms when it's exposed that the pop trolls once hogged all the strings. A very obvious reference to colonization and cultural music appropriation. Oh, and when Poppy insists that all trolls are the same, she's given a harsh lesson on how this well-meaning mindset is actually very ignorant and could be seen as culture blindness. But we are not all the same. It's why all our strings are different, because they reflect our different music. Denying our differences is denying the truth of who we are. I was quite impressed that a Trolls movie of all things was willing to go to these hot topics. It is cool seeing all the very Trolls cultures, each retaining the same felt craft aesthetic, Heck, I was always excited to see which genre would be next on the map. My problem is that these cultures are mainly made up of shallow stereotypes, and we don't get to know these communities beyond their adventure obstacle roles, because the movie is very eager to move on to whatever's next. I'm also not a fan of how the rock trolls are the villains. Metalheads are such low hanging fruit when it comes to musical bad guys, which I find kind of annoying, because rock fans already have a very unfair demonised reputation, and this cliche doesn't help. It would have actually been really refreshing to see a different genre as the villains. Barb is a great character though, a feisty punk girl who loves a rock legend dad and is passionate about her favourite music, but behind her energetic fierceness, she's kind of lonely. And when I do like that the film lets her argue her points against pop music's flaws. Pop music isn't even real music! It's bland! It's repetitive! The lyrics are empty! It's a shame that the film criminally underuses her until the finale. Trolls World Tour is a low-key slight step up from the first movie, thanks to its deeper themes, more varied genres of music for its jukebox soundtrack, and memorable badass villain. It is just let down by the franchise's typical bad habits, and lots of wasted creative potential. Joseph King of Dreams. This is a prequel to The Prince of Egypt that adapts the story of Joseph, a miracle baby who is showered with attention by his doting father, and has been granted the power to read dreams by God. This special treatment makes his brothers jealous, so they decide to sell him off as a slave. While working as a slave for the Pharaoh's kingdom, an official called Potiphar makes him his personal assistant. But Potiphar's wife seduces Joseph, and Joseph rejects her advances. So she falsely accuses him of attempted assault, which leads to Potiphar reluctantly and unfairly imprisoning Joseph in the dungeon. Much time later, Potiphar feels guilty, frees Joseph, and convinces the pharaoh to let Joseph be the official royal dream reader. This new job makes him a respectable figure in the kingdom, and he starts his own family. Then, one day, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt seeking food. Joseph is reluctant to believe that they have changed, so he tests them by seeing if they'll stand up for their youngest brother Benjamin by framing him as a thief, and they're all very quick to defend their sibling. Joseph reveals his real identity and forgives all his brothers. I will admit that out of all the DreamWorks sequels, this one has the worst animation. I know that's to be expected, when it's the only one that went straight to video, but it's hard to ignore the enormous decline in quality compared to The Prince of Egypt. That being said, the movie has some pretty striking dream sequences, with their abstract imagery lending well to the open canvas that animation presents. I was actually impressed that a film this cheap had dream sequences this creative. I did also quite enjoy seeing Joseph rising up the ranks of the kingdom. It's interesting watching him progress forward based on his charisma and intelligence. Joseph isn't just a dream-reading miracle baby. He's also a well-educated gentleman who can outwit crooks and pitch ideas to the pharaoh. During the years of plenty, have him collect one-fifth of the grain from every field and store it under guard. Then, during the years of famine, give it back to the people. However, King of Dreams never really amounts to being anything more than just okay. It's good for straight-to-video standards, and its story of finding perseverance in spite of constant bad luck is kind of inspiring, but it's quite a step down from The Prince of Egypt. While The Prince of Egypt blew me away with its stunning ambition, I managed to emotionally resonate with me despite my atheist beliefs, 
King of Dreams is more like being in a Sunday school class, and there wasn't enough here to make up for how religiously preachy and alienating I found it. Puss in Boots. In this prequel to the Shrek films, we follow Puss's origins as an orphaned kitty, who befriended a young Humpty Dumpty. Humpty and Puss developed a mutual dream of finding their legendary magic beanstalk beans, and bonded as blood brothers. However, after Puss became a local hero, the two grew apart. Then, Humpty tricked Puss into helping him rob a bank, which brought shame to his adoptive mother. Once the authorities arrived, Puss bailed on Humpty. Years later, Humpty and his partner in crime Kitty Softpaws convinced Puss to help them find the magic beans at long last. I think a gooey centre of this movie has to be the relatable love that Puss feels for his mother. Despite being this suave and cheeky scoundrel, he deeply cares about what his mother thinks of him, and has dedicated his life to restoring his reputation. Wait. Do not fight them, please. Mama. Listen to me, I can't explain. No. Puss. No more running. But the meat of this movie has to be Puss, Kitty and Humpty's beanstalk adventure. Their fairy tale quest is full of danger and obstacles that keep us on our toes. Almost there! <laughs> Plus the terrible Jack and Jill are very intimidating antagonists on their journey. <laughs> Kitty and Puss's chemistry really sizzles too. You can feel so much romantic tension between them, and their constant flirting is so damn endearing. There is one word for you, Kitty Softpaws. Me wow. I know you have quite a reputation with the ladies. Mr. Frisky two times. I've also been known as the fairy lover. <laughs> But that was before I met you. However, there's certainly something shady going on, which makes Kitty's growing crush on Puss complicated, and she does try to send warning signs. Then, it's revealed that everything was one big conspiracy cooked up by Humpty for revenge. A twist revealed that was decently built up while retaining some element of mystery. You can tell that Kitty is really guilty for this, so much so that we buy that she's genuinely sorry when she decides to help save Puss. I am here because you made me realize that there is something I care about more than gold. Something? Okay. Someone. I'm very reluctant to forgive Humpty, though, even when he shows remorse at the end, because he's tricked Puss twice now and was prepared to let a giant goose destroy the town out of petty vengeance. The attempt at giving him a redemption arc is way too late for me. I will not let you go, Humpty. I know you won't. So I won't make you choose. Humpty! The humor for this movie is good? It doesn't have the same rapid fire rhythm as the Shrek films, but when a joke does land, it's really, really funny. Is it true a cat always lands on its feet? No! That is just a rumor spread by dogs! I do wish that there were less gaps between the jokes that worked. Much like King of Dreams 2, Puss and Boots is nothing more than just passable. Like, there is some good stuff here, and I love the spaghetti western cinematic presentation throughout the whole thing. But I've never really felt in the mood to watch this film. I like it, but I'd only give it a bronze medal. The Penguins of Madagascar we follow Skipper, Private, Rico, and Kowalski as they try to stop a mad scientist octopus from turning penguins ugly in revenge for being cuter than octopi. However, they'll have to team up with the Arctic squad the North Wind to pull off this mission. The penguins have always stolen the spotlight in the Madagascar films and even deservedly got their own TV show thanks to their popularity, so it's no surprise that DreamWorks eventually gave them starring roles in a major movie. While this film isn't as funny as I remember, it still got a decent amount of laughs out of me, with a lot of the humour coming from the snappy rhythm of the penguins' military shtick. Alright soldiers, you better blend in. Riverdance. or the supporting characters being driven around the bend by our heroes in majority. No! This mission has no place for a pathetic bottle whoa, whoa, of useless whoa, whoa. drawings. Who are you calling pathetic? Dave himself is a good villain to go up against the penguins, a scientist who takes himself way too seriously and has let his misguided hate towards the little birds distract him from the bigger picture. It wasn't the penguins who ruined his zoo life, it was the humans who underappreciated the quirky and fun appeal of Octopi. But what I think I really love about this movie is the family love between the penguins. Even though their leader, Skipper, likes to be a strict perfectionist with their missions, you can tell that he really loves his fellow penguins, especially the youngest member, Private. The penguins never have any melodramatic fallouts, but they do need to learn to better appreciate Private beyond his cuteness. 
the end conclusion being that he's the heart of the team. A role that fits him perfectly, because he's always been the conscience of the Penguins. The Penguins of Madagascar is the very definition of well-executed tongue-in-cheek simplicity. It takes a comedic dynamic that worked really well in the Madagascar films and proves that it can hold the whole movie, a feathered gem in the DreamWorks sequel library. Madagascar Free, Europe's Most Wanted When Alex and friends end up in Europe, they're reported to pest control leader Capitan Dubois, who goes on an obsessive chase to track them down. So our heroes convince a bunch of circus animals that they're performers too, and hide out on their train. Then, the penguins buy said circus, and start an animal-run business. The problem is that this is a struggling circus full of animals who have lost their passion, so Alex inspires everyone to improve themselves and get their spark back. I'm not even a Madagascar fan, and I love this third entry. It has a big cast of characters this time, but I feel like the film does a good job balancing the Madagascar animals with the circus troupe, both getting just as much screen time and focus as each other. There's been some tension between the circus animals ever since Fratelli the Hoop Jumping Tiger had a tragic accident, but once Alex lights a flame under the tent, everyone reconnects, and you can see that closeness that they once had is now reignited. It's this camaraderie that gives the film its syrupy heart, and makes us care about the circus being a smash. Listen, man, you may have given up on yourself, but your friends haven't given up on you. Are you just gonna turn your back on them and sit and eat borscht the rest of your life? Or are you gonna get out there and jump through that tiny little hoop? I love the animation for this movie too. There's a Looney Tunes-esque ridiculousness to it that's done with great invention and clever timing. Unlike the previous films, it's not wacky antics for the sake of wacky antics. There's actual pacing and creativity this time. Mm. You're in a big trouble. <gasps> now you're really in a big trouble. Ooh. And now you're really, really in a big front. I'm a new. The circus performances themselves are the highlight visuals, though. They're stunning and colourful sequences that embrace the freedom that comes with animation. Oh, and the villain? She is S tier. This badass yet creepy woman who knocks everything out of her way to get what she wants, but is also smart enough to pull herself out of jams. She's an unstoppable and intelligent machine who wants our main character's head as a trophy. Hi, banana gun! <laughs> Now, yes, we do get a lies reveal when the circus animals find out the truth about Alex and his friends, but it's this split up that leads to the Madagascar characters realising that New York is no longer their home, and the circus troupe learning that they really have evolved as performers. All in all, Madagascar 3 is one hell of a bang to end a trilogy. A vibrantly creative, very hilarious, and heartfelt circus tour movie that greatly surpasses its prequels. How to Train Your Dragon The Hidden World Hiccup is now the chief of Berk, but he's running out of space for Vikings to share with dragons, so he vows to find a new, bigger home for everyone to live on. Meanwhile, a dragon hunter called Grimmel sets a live fury as bait for Toothless, so that he can have the alpha dragon in his power. After Toothless finds his new queen, our heroes end up discovering the legendary hidden world of dragons. This film was never going to hit the same peak as How to Train Your Dragon 2, and I think DreamWorks knew that. Instead, we get this bittersweet and melancholic film that dives into our characters' internal fears of change, with the Vikings needing to accept the possibility that this may be their goodbye to their dragon friends. A somber horizon that deeply frightens Hiccup, who sees Toothless as his best mate, and has dedicated his life to building a Viking and dragon community. You gave him his freedom, Hiccup. What were you expecting? I never thought he'd stay away for good! I... I... <sighs> Grimmel himself is a villain that's truly fun to hate. He has no empathy for dragon lives, and creepily sees hunting as this fun little game. Oh, isn't this fun? Yes? No. Ugh. Yes. Yes. <sighs> Where is your love of the hunt? I thought you were conquerors. While he's not as visually imposing as Drago, he's certainly a lot smarter, and way more strategic, making the rivalry between our heroes and villain a lot more psychological. You wish dragons to live free among us, like equals? A toxic notion, my boy. History has shown that we are the superior species. However, the film isn't all bleakness and sadness, because there's this adorable charm to the growing romantic bond between Toothless and the Life Yori. It's really awkward, but in an adorkable sort of way, and Hiccup being down for playing wingman is testament to their friendship.
I can't say that The Hidden World is a firework explosion to this trilogy's end, but sometimes a franchise doesn't have to finish with a bang. It can just be a nuanced last chapter that wraps things up by having characters processing the end as they say their goodbyes to the friends they've made. Heck, it's this quietly poignant conclusion that makes the emotional end credits hit hard every single time. Shrek Forever After. Shrek tires of the repetition of family lives recycled routines and misses the freedom of being a scary ogre. These frustrations erupt into the open after being bugged and pestered at his child's loud, chaotic birthday party, and he admits to Fiona that he wishes he could have his old life back, which hurts his wife. After hearing Shrek's woes, the slimy Rumpelstiltskin seduces Shrek into signing a contract, which will give him a chance to be an ogre again for 24 hours, in trade for Shrek's memory of being born. At first, Shrek delights in the fun of being a frightening monster to the public again, but then he finds out that this is a Rumpelstiltskin-owned world where he never existed, which means that none of his friends know him and he never started a family with Fiona. With Donkey's help though, Shrek finds out that there is an exit clause in Rumpelstiltskin's contract. If he receives a true love's kiss before the day is over, then everything will return to normal. But that'll be tricky when Fiona doesn't know him in this universe, and is way more focused on running an ogre revolution against Rumpelstiltskin. If I'm frank, I always used to find this to be my least favourite Shrek movie, but times have changed, and now I see it as a great swan song to the series. It uses the template of It's a Wonderful Life to strip away Shrek's happily ever after, so that we can unpack the building blocks of Shrek lore, and better appreciate how certain fates came to be. When you take Shrek out of the picture, everyone's lives are a lot worse off, because he was the fairy tale hero who gave oddballs a family. Shrek has to come to learn that his own happiness isn't the only thing that matters, and that his very existence is a powerful gear and a machine for other people's happiness. If your life was so perfect, then why'd you sign it all the way to Rumpelstiltskin in the first place? Because I didn't know what I had until it was gone, all right? I also love how optimism triumphs over pessimism in this movie. Even though this alternate universe is a dystopian hellhole where people live in fear and poverty, Shrek's very presence naturally restores the balance. As if the film is saying, if it's meant to be, it will be. Shrek and Donkey are destined to be best friends. Puss and Donkey are supposed to be the perfect sidekick duo. And you are a catastrophe. And you are redonkulous. <laughs> and Shrek and Fiona will always have a chemistry to spark. Speaking of the romance, while it is kind of cringe watching Shrek desperately wooing Fiona, it's these embarrassing failures that help him realise that true love cannot be forced, and he needs to prove that he cares about Fiona by supporting her revolution. Oh, and I love what this sequel does with Fiona. Heck, this is the most Fiona-centric Shrek film since the original, because it deep dives into what makes Fiona who she is, and explores the pain she must have felt while waiting for a prince who never came. True love didn't get me out of that tower. I did. I saved myself. Don't you get it? It's all just a big fairy tale. Now, sure, Rumpelstiltskin is perhaps the least visually intimidating Shrek villain to date, but the film compensates for this by showing how powerful he is in spite of his cutesy design, from his own minions being afraid of his punishments. Maybe we could hire a professional bounty hunter? Ah. What a world! What a world! to the people of Far Far Away begging for his transactions to improve their crappy lives. This is a wormy, manipulative guy who is creepily talented at taking advantage of people's weaknesses. Shrek 4 is a sequel that expands on its world building by developing ogre culture, but also deconstructs Shrek as a franchise by twisting time itself. I'm actually excited to watch it again to find even more stuff to like about it. How to Train Your Dragon 2 Dragons and Vikings now live peacefully on the island of Berk. However, Hiccup is annoyed that his dad, Stoic, keeps insisting that he becomes chief next, something he doesn't feel up for, especially when he doesn't even know himself yet. Then, we find out that an evil man called Drago Bloodvist is trying to capture and dominate every dragon in the world. Hiccup tries to go after Drago, but ends up bumping into his long-lost mum, Valka, and the whole family is reunited. However, Drago interrupts all this joy when he storms Valka's shelter for dragons, starts a whole war, and uses an alpha dragon to hypnotise Toothless into attacking Hiccup. But Stoic jumps into the line of fire to protect his son, so Toothless and Hiccup must work together to strip Drago of his dragon army. This movie has insanely high stakes. While the first film was basically E.T. but with dragons, its first sequel is a grand-scale war. We're left wondering how enough Drago can be defeated when he's on such a fast-paced rise to power. At the same time though, the drama has been amped up too. We get to see a Viking family reunite, from Hiccup finally meeting the mother that he never knew. Will you give me another chance? 
it's a stoic getting to show his wife that he still passionately adores her. You're as beautiful as the day I lost you. But we then suddenly have to say goodbye to Stoic in a very tasteful and authentic Viking funeral scene. It's a heartbreaking moment that pays affectionate respect to a major beloved character, but also lets his grieving loved ones reminisce about what Stoic meant to them. Our villain is also one of the most terrifying DreamWorks baddies ever. I mean, just listen to the horrifying scream he makes when he's controlling an alpha dragon. He claims that he set out to control dragons to protect humankind, but we can tell that he only cares about being an unstoppable force. Hiccup naively believes that he can convince this nut job to be friends with dragons, but he has to come to realise that he can't always play peacekeeper. The world wants peace, and we have the answer. Back on Burke. Just let me show you. No! Let me show you. The only aspect of the film that I've come to dislike is the poorly aged joke of Rough Nut being handsy and creepy with a very uncomfortable Aram. Those scenes make me cringe now. How to Train Your Dragon 2 pushes the franchise beyond its humble roots by introducing a cinematic dragon war and intensifying the tragedy, all while vividly exploring the differences between loyal friendship and possessive control. Puss in Boots The Last Wish Puss is a famous legend across the lands, but after getting killed during a quest, he realises that he actually only has one life left, and decides to retire. Then, he learns of a magic star that can grant any wish at all, including eight extra lives. This inspires Puss to put his boots back on, and go after the map to said star with help from Perito the Therapy Dog. However, Puss isn't the only one who wants the star. Evil Jack Horner, Goldilocks and the Free Bears, and Kitty Softpaws are also eager to hunt for the star. So Puss agrees to team up with Kitty after years apart, and they go on an adventure full of many hazardous obstacles, while competing against other wish-hungry fairy tale characters. To make things even more difficult, Puss is being haunted by death himself who comes in the form of a scythe-carrying wolf. Many audiences hyped this movie up big time when it came out, and after it finally released in the UK this year, I can totally understand why. It's very much about Puss going through an existential crisis above anything. He's lived a life of popularity, but it's come at the cost of being alone and taking his mortality for granted. He has to come to appreciate that true human connection and sentimental experiences will always trump leaving behind a memorable legacy. It's his friendship with Kitty and Perito that helps him realise that there's more to life than fame, with his romance for Kitty being re-sparked by their adventure, and Perito serving as the perfect therapy dog to his panic attacks. The adventure itself is really exciting, because the map's obstacles are dictated by whoever holds the map, so paths and directions can suddenly be warped if the map's user changes. It makes for a really unpredictable journey, but it's the villains that people have been praising the most. A wide mix of different types of antagonists that show the range of flavours that enemies can come in. Jack Horner being the irredeemably evil monster, Goldilocks as a sympathetic and misguided orphan who has to learn to appreciate her bare family, and Death serving as this neutral force that represents the very idea of life's end. It's kind of amazing that a 6 out of 10 film like Puss and Boots has gone on to inspire a sequel this high quality. A film that tells a relatable tale of a mental health crisis, while also being a super entertaining and funny race adventure. Believe the hype, because I guarantee that it lives up to it. Kung Fu Panda 2. Long ago, the peacock rulers of Gongmeng City invented fireworks for celebration and peace. But their son, Shen, saw the potential in using the gunpowder and fireworks as a weapon of destruction. A soothsayer warns Shen's parents that if he goes down this obsessive path, he'd one day be stopped by a warrior of black and white. This motivated Shen to wipe out all of the pandas. Said genocidal attack caused Shen's parents to officially banish him from the kingdom. Cut to modern day, Shifu informs Po that he needs to find inner peace, and the silly panda is very eager to reach said enlightenment. Suddenly, a band of wolves starts stealing the valley's metal, so our heroes jump into action, but Poe randomly stones up when he recognises a symbol on the wolf's armour, which sparks a blurring memory of when Poe was abandoned by his mother. We then learn that all the stolen metal has gone towards making cannons for Lord Chen who uses his new weapon to take back his family's castle from some guarding martial arts masters. Poe and the Furious Five head to Shen's castle to rescue the masters from prison, but these legends refuse to be set free, in case things escalate further. So, Poe leads a takedown of Shen, which is a total disaster, and the panda wakes up in his childhood village, where Shen's former soothsayer encourages the dragon warrior to unlock his trauma. Poe suddenly recalls the panda genocide, 
and that Po's mom was actually trying to hide him from Shen's army. Now, Po must face his inner demons and stop Shen's mighty cannons. I already love the first Kung Fu Panda, but this sequel goes above and beyond to exceed what came before it. To begin with, it's packed with a varied range of martial arts styles. It's not just the same kinds of fights all the way through. We get comedic Jackie Chan inspired martial arts. <laughs> Is that all you got? Because it feels like I'm fighting a big old fluffy cloud. Well, this cloud is about to bring the thunder. An emotional throwdowns that push the story forward. Here we go. No more running, Shen. So it seems. Now, answers. Shen is also a fantastic and iconic DreamWorks villain with a uniquely sharp and elegant design. There's not only a grace in his very presence, but also in his slick fighting style. He's a peacock who's let his parents' banishment consume him, to the point where he's become a paranoid perfectionist as a conqueror, and he can never be at peace with what his parents did, which cleverly contrasts against Poe's own journey to enlightenment. How did you find peace? I took away your parents. Everything. I, I scarred you for life. See, that's the thing, Shen. Scars heal. Speaking of Poe's arc, I really like how it's a lesson on how martial arts isn't all about being strong. Without a clear mind, Poe can't focus in a fight or reach his best potential. It's only when he processes his childhood trauma that he finally masters the art of inner peace, which in turn helps him to use his mind and soul to deflect, dodge, and return Shen's cannonballs. Kung Fu Panda 2 is an animated masterpiece to me, an emotional adventure that delicately explores the power of healing psychological trauma, and how being a badass doesn't mean repressing your emotions. Shrek 2. Shrek and Fiona have just come home from their honeymoon when they're suddenly invited to Fiona's home kingdom of far, far away to meet her parents. Unfortunately, Fiona's dad, King Harold, is very against his daughter being married to an ogre. This news also upsets Fiona's fairy godmother, who wanted her son Prince Charming to rescue Fiona. Fairy godmother pesters Harold to take care of things, so he hires Puss and Boots to assassinate Shrek, but this completely backfires and Puss joins Shrek's team. Shrek, Puss, and Donkey break into Fairy Godmother's factory and steal a happily ever after potion, in hopes that it will make Shrek human enough for his dad-in-law. Said potion transforms Shrek into a handsome gentleman, Donkey into a stallion, and Fiona back into a human. Shrek will have to give Fiona a true love's kiss before midnight to make the potion's magic last forever. Unfortunately, Shrek is too late, and Prince Charming has convinced everyone that he's the new Shrek. For quite a while, I thought this movie was a little overrated. I think that it was maybe because my constant replays of it as a kid made me sick of it. But after re-watching it for this video, I actually totally understand the praise a lot more now. It's a masterfully told continuation that follows all the principles of a great sequel. Instead of repeating a successful formula, Shrek 2 moves things forward. In the first movie, Shrek had finally found the courage to let others in and express his love to Fiona. But he never really learned to love himself. That's where the sequel comes in. Sure, Fiona makes him happy, but once he leaves the bubble of the swamp and meets his prejudiced dad-in-law, he suddenly feels really inadequate and this insecurity drives him to change physically. I know some folks have said that Fiona gets underused in this film, but I think she's the movie's unsung hero. Not only is she the only one to question Prince Charming's Shrek act, which leads to his eventual defeat, but it's only when Shrek stops listening to his fears and lets his wife talk that he learns to finally love himself for who he is. I want what any princess wants. To live happily ever after. <laughs> With the ogre I married. This is also our first introduction to Puss in Boots, who goes from being an antagonistic obstacle to a fantastic new member of Shrek's oddball entourage. At first, he brings some engaging tension to Shrek and Donkey's dynamic, but these sidekicks' mutual love for Shrek leads them to becoming one of the best DreamWorks duos. Pray for mercy from Puss and Donkey! But I can't ignore the magnificent diva herself, Fairy Godmother. A fabulous supervillainess who steals the spotlight with her flamboyant glamour and hilariously relatable quirks. Harold, you force me to do something I really don't want to do. <gasps> Where are we? Well, hi there. Welcome to Friars Fat Boy. May I take your order? My diet is ruined! I hope you're happy. She may seem wholesome on the surface, but she's actually a close-minded and cruel woman who is happy to use her royal connections and fame to conspire against poor Shrek, while also punching him down enough to convince him to stay out of her way. Don't you think you've already messed her life up enough? I just wanted her to be happy. 
And now she can be. Oh, sweetheart. She's finally found the prince of her dreams. Oh, and we can't forget about the finale that made this film a cult classic. A heart-pounding climax that combines Shrek riding a gingerbread kaiju as he storms into the far, far away castle, all while fairy godmother beautifully sings an iconic, bombastic cover of holding out for a hero to keep charming seduction scheme on track. Shrek 2 really deserves its place in the DreamWorks Hall of Fame. It's a movie that set a very, very high bar for animated sequels, for a compelling story of an ogre coming to find self-love, and defying human society's idea of what he deserves. A classic through and through. So that's my official ranking list for all 17 DreamWorks sequels. Which is your favourite sequel from this beloved studio? Let everyone know in the comments below, and don't forget to click that like button. I've been Jambariki, feel free to subscribe, cheerio folks. Mm.